pleasure to introduce you to introduce today's panel. We have Dr. Kim Layton, the current chair of the Standards Committee. We have Dr. Barbara Sittner, the immediate past chair Your of the Standards Committee. Is being recorded. And we have Dr. Jane Page, lead on the simulation design and contributed to many of the other standards. We will um, be handing over to our our presenters in just a moment. I just want to let everyone know that we'll have plenty of time at the end of the presentations for your questions. If questions arise through the presentation, please just enter them in the chat feature and we'll be sure to answer them at the end of our presentation. And with that, I'm going to hand over to Dr. Barbara Sidner. Good afternoon. So nice to meet you in this virtual world. We are delighted to provide you with education on the INAXL standards of best practice simulation. And today it's oper operationalizing the revised INAXL standards of best practice simulation. On the next page we have our disclosures that we would like to present to you. And then we would like to present the objectives of our presentation. So at the conclusion of this educational program, Learners will be able to name the titles and focus of the INAXL Standards of Best Practice Simulation of 2016, determine at least one strategy for operationalizing each standard, integrate the standards into simulation scenarios and programs, and determine the resources needed to oper operationalize the standards at your institution. Here are some key references for you to keep in mind as you design and plan your simulation experiences. First and foremost, we have our INAXL standards of best practice simulation. And they're available at the following websites. And so I'm going to tell you the very first website, INAXL.org. You can download the INAXL standards of best practice simulation for free. And then the second website is our Clinical Simulation and Nursing Organizations Journal. So you will also find them in there. Other key references are the Society for Simulation in Healthcare, and they have a healthcare simulation dictionary that expands on the terminology that we are using in our simulation world. Other things that might be of interest, especially if you're doing interprofessional collaboration with your simulation scenarios, is the International, or excuse me, Interprofessional Education Collaborative. And they have core competencies for interprofessional collaboration, and you can apply these competencies to simulation scenarios. A hallmark research study that was done and published in 2014 is from the United States, and it's the National Council of State Boards of Nursing National Simulation Study. Many people are referring to this study because in this document, it says that people can substitute up to 50% of clinical time if people are trained with simulation and follow the guidelines of INAXL standards. And then the last is the guidelines for, from the National Council of State Boards of Nursing where it says that they really um, state that we really, really need to use the, the standards to guide our simulation practices. And people that are using our, the simulation as an educational strategy or research or simulation for clinical performance at a hospital really need to follow the simulation standards. And that people that are involved with simulation really need to be trained on this methodology and have the tools necessary to, to support simulation. So on the next slide, it's very important that we give you a little historical information on the history of the standards. And so this is going to be a brief overview. But just so that you know that presently, the INAXL standards undergo review and revision every three years to capture the most current evidence-based practice and research to provide educators, clinicians, and researchers with best practices to design, conduct, and evaluate simulation-based experiences. In 2009, the work began on the simulation standards under the direction of one of our presenters today, Dr. Kim Layton. And then they were published. The initial publication became present for all of us in 2011. 
In 2013, there was a standards committee that revised the 2011 standards. 2014, as I mentioned before, is when the national simulation study results were published. And in 2015, simulation is a science that keeps growing and expanding based on research and practice. And so two new standards were added. And the guidelines for simulation were published by the National Council of State Boards of Nursing. In 2016, this is where the present standards were revised and there became a new formatting based on feedback from external reviewers. Now, there were a lot of different committees that looked at the 2013 INAXL standards of best practice. And so on the next two slides are listed those organizations that contributed by providing feedback on the 2013 standards, which the standards committee embraced and made edits and did the revisions that were published in 2016. So here is page one and page two. So hopefully you can see the interconnect, international connection that we have with revising and publishing our standards. So what's new? Based on the feedback from the international organizations that reviewed the INAXL standards of best practice, the Simulation Standards Committee did a line-by-line -line analysis of the feedback. And through this, we identified content overlap and gaps, and then reviewed the literature to find what the current practice was. So with that review and the feedback that we received from the external reviewers, the decision was made and it was supported by the INAXL Board of Directors and our simulation community and the organizations that reviewed it, that we have a new format. And so with the new formatting, we now have a background section that has some cited literature that supports the standards. And something new that we added was potential consequences of not following the standard, such as um, in the design standard, if individuals do not follow what the standard states, it might be that there, the, the participants might have an untoward outcome with their learning. Another thing that was changed was we removed the numbers from the standards. So standard one was terminology, standard two was participant integrity. And so the standard committee thought, and along with the board of directors, were supported by removing the numbers so that we wouldn't have a hierarchy. Terminology is no longer a standard, and that was changed to a glossary so that the glossary includes the terminology that is used with the present standards. And then, of course, we updated it with all kinds of new evidence to support our standards. Through this work, we published, the organization published the standards in 2016, and these are the standards that we're going to talk about today. Simulation design, outcomes and objectives, facilitation, debriefing, participant evaluation, professional integrity, Simulation Enhanced Interprofessional Education, abbreviated SIM IPE, and then the SIM Glossary. So that's a brief overview because we want to save time at the end for your questions. And I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Jane Page. Thank you, Barb. And welcome, everybody, from Canada. I'm actually coming to you from Wisconsin, so just south of your border. Um, I'm going to talk about three standards. The first one will be simulation design. And your interest in really learning about these best practices for designing and conducting simulation is so important to us as nurse educators. You know, we all want our students and learners to have the best possible educational experience, and these standards really help us guide us on that. As you look at this slide here, and, and as we go through each of the standards, you'll see the citation listed underneath. So this is where you could do and how you can word it if you're going to cite it in any source. It is important to keep in mind that these standards are a collective whole and should be used as such. Um, the first standard I'm talking about um, is a good starting point, the simulation design. 
and this is probably one um, to start with, especially if you're new to the standards or new to use of a simulation. Um, hopefully you've had a chance to use the link to download the standards. And I would suggest as we go through these, if you have a hard copy with you, to really um, take notes on it, write, um, write things on it, think about things that you want to add or change as we go through the standards for some of the simulations you're using. So the simulation design standard states that simulation-based experiences are purposely designed to meet identified objectives and optimize the achievement of the expected outcomes. This standard has 11 criteria, and I'll kind of go through briefly um, little points on each one of those. Criterion one is to perform a needs assessment to provide the foundational evidence for the need for, the well for a well-designed simulation. So this means there should be evidence for conducting this simulation, and not just that there's an interest or your capability to conduct one on a particular topic. Criterion two is to construct measurable objectives. And note that other standards will link back to this design standard. So for example, there will be a standard I'll mention in a minute on outcomes and objectives. Stand, or criterion three is to structure the format of the simulation based on the purpose, theory, and modality for the simulation. Criterion four is to design a scenario or case to provide the context for the simulation. So for example, a scenario should include a situation or backstory, should include clinical progression and cues, time frames for each of the events, and a written script. Criterion five is to use various types of fidelity to create this um, perception of realism. And it's important when you keep fidelity in mind to consider that there are physical, conceptual, and psycho uh, psychological dimensions to fidelity. Criterion six is to maintain a facilitative approach. And I'll talk again on the standard that um, relates to facilitation. Criterion seven is to begin the simulation with a pre-briefing, while criterion eight includes a debriefing or a feedback session following the simulation. And then criterion nine stipulates um, the need to include evaluation of the participants, but also you evaluate the facilitator, evaluate the simulation it itself, your facility, and the support team. And criterion 10 is to provide information to the participants before it starts. So these are preparation materials and resources and all with the goal to help them meet their identified objectives and their expected outcomes. And then finally, criterion 11 is to pilot test the simulation before it's fully implemented. The next standard is on outcomes and objectives. And again, you can see the citation. And the standard states that all simulation-based experiences begin with the development of measurable objectives, which are designed to achieve the expected outcomes. There are two criteria in this standard. And the first one is that you determine expected outcomes for the simulation-based activities and or the program. So following the needs assessment, which you you know, heard about in the design standard, the next step is to develop expected outcomes. And that is, what do you hope your learners will achieve at the end of the simulation? And as educators, clinicians, researchers, we utilize these outcome measures to determine the impact of this um, learning from the simulation. So following the development of those outcomes, you then need to develop measurable objectives, which are used to determine if the learner met those expected outcomes. And as you can see, the um, objectives are constructed with a SMART format. And that means they're specific, measurable, achievable, realistic, and time-based. So this is not unusual with educational theory. And so, for example, when you're um, writing these objectives, you want to evaluate them for this. So, for example, an objective that is not SMART would be something like um, the nursing student identifies the patient. If we put it in a SMART format, it would read something more like, the nursing student will identify the patient using two identifiers prior to each medication administration during the simulation. So you could see that would be easily measured, um, realistic, and very specific. When developing objectives, you want to incorporate Bloom's taxonomy. 
You want to consider the learning domains, such as knowledge, skills, and attitudes. And you want to ensure that your objectives are written at a level appropriate to the learner. All right, and then the next standard is on facilitation. And as you can see, there are two statements in this standard. The first one is facilitation methods are varied, and the use of a specific method is dependent on the learning needs of the participants and the expected outcomes. And the second part of this standard is a facilitator assumes responsibility and oversight for managing the entire simulation-based experience. And as you can see, the role of facilitator is essential to the success of a, the simulation activity. And there are five criteria here. The criterion one requires a facilitator who has specific skills and knowledge in simulation pedagogy. There is initial and ongoing assessment of one's skills, knowledge, and facilitation performance. Criterion two is the facilitative approach is appropriate to the level of learning, the experience, and the competency of the participants. So for example, um, in each of, the, of these criteria, there are uh, required elements. So if you're um, running a simulation, you want to continue it with or without interruption, depending on the level of the participants and their objectives. So in other words, you need to decide ahead of time if it's okay to stop a simulation while in process. Otherwise, you let it continue. And criterion three specifies that facilitation methods occur before the simulation and include those preparatory activities and a pre-briefing. And when you look at the required elements here, you'll be able to um, see some bulleted lists on what should really be contained in a pre-briefing. Criteria four specifies facilitation methods during a simulation. And these include the delivery of cues. So here, cues can be considered either predetermined ones that are incorporated into the simulation as you're designing it based on what you know are common anticipated actions of, of the participants. And all those are to help uh, move them forward in reaching their uh, learning objectives. There are also unplanned cues. So there are times in simulations that students and learners do things that we really did not anticipate. So you have to figure out how you're going to respond to those unanticipated participant actions. And then finally, um, criterion five addresses how facilitation occurs after and beyond the simulation. So you may have um, had situations where it was necessary to work with students or participants who needed some additional time to process new knowledge or sometimes personally deal with the events that had transpired. Sometimes this occurs a day or a week or so later. There may even be times that it's necessary to follow up any pro with any professional integrity issues that need to be addressed. All right, so I'm going to pass it on now. Hi, everybody. This is Kim. Um, thanks for joining us this afternoon. This next standard is focused on debriefing. So um, it's focused on the need for all simulation-based experiences to include a planned debriefing session. So remember that simulation is not just mannequin-based activity, but it encompasses is all the other types as well, like virtual environments. So a lot of times um, we tend to assign virtual experiences, but we, for, we kind of forget about the need to debrief the learners after those experiences, especially if it's an individual assignment that we've asked them to complete. Now, um, recall also there is a difference between feedback and debriefing. So feedback tends to focus on really specific aspects of the learner's performance with the goal of um, improving that performance. Debriefing is focused on using reflection to understand what occurred and how to improve, as well as to transfer the learning to practice. So this slide outlines the criteria that's necessary to meet the standard. So most important, not just anybody can debrief. So the person facilitating the debriefing needs to have been present and attentive during the simulation. And that has, historically, that didn't used to happen. Sometimes the, the group would come in and do their scenario, and then they would be taken to a debriefing room where another faculty person who was not in the scenario room 
was responsible for debriefing. So criterion is that um, the person facilitating the debriefing needs to be present and know what's going on during the simulation. They also need to know the simulation well and to understand how the patient or situation is to be managed. So um, I have always stayed as far away from OB and, and labor and delivery as possible. So when I'm helping with OB-related scenarios, I'm not the best one to be the debriefer um, because I don't really understand well how to take care of those patients. Now the debriefer also needs to be competent and use a theoretical framework and, and a structured approach to debriefing. So this leads to two um, really important challenges for your program. One is, you know, how do you develop faculty so that they learn sound debriefing practices? And then two, how do you measure faculty? So um, these, these items here are, are well supported by the recommendations of the National Council of State Boards of Nursing study because they very clearly state that um, debriefing should be facilitated by a subject matter expert who conducts theory-based debriefing. Then additionally, we need to ensure that debriefing occurs in an environment that allows the learners to feel comfortable and confident as they explore their actions and responses during the scenario while we're, we're guiding them to meet the objectives and the outcomes of the experience. There are a lot of different types of debriefing methods, uh, which is, is beyond the scope of today's presentation. But we did want to share with you um, three that are theory-based, um, debriefing for meaningful learning, uh, debriefing with good judgment, and then a newer one, which is promoting excellence and reflective learning and simulation, also known as the PEARLS method. The PEARLS method um, brings together some of the concepts from various other models and helps us to understand how um, debriefing choices can be situation specific. So we might not use um, debriefing for meaningful learning for every kind of simulation that we do. There may be cases where debriefing with good judgment is a, a better choice for us and vice versa. And so um, the PEARLS model helps us to see how to use the different methods um, for different situations. And then we also, in your handouts, you'll see the references for those debriefing um, articles. So now we're going to move on to the evaluation standard. And this standard states that all simulation-based experiences require participation, participant evaluation, not evaluation by the participants, although that's also very important. But this one talks about evaluation of the participants. Now, a lot of times we equate evaluation with grading. And most nursing programs do not use simulation with grades attached. And so let's look at what evaluation means in the context of this standard. So first of all, you have to determine how you're going to evaluate prior to the experience, because that needs to be communicated to the learners. If they're coming into this experience um, and expecting to be able to make mistakes and learn from their mistakes, but you're planning to put a grade on how they perform, then that's a huge disconnect. So that's why it's so important to understand that ahead of time. Then let's look at the three types of evaluation. So formative, that's where we focus on progress. So how well is the learner progressing in their ability to provide safe care, or their ability to critically think, or use clinical judgment, or communicate, or you know any of the other aspects that we use simulation to evaluate. Now summative is when we evaluate at a certain point in time. So we often do that at midterm or at the end of the course. And what we're trying to decide is, has the learner met our criteria? And that's usually associated with a grade. So what we have to really think about here is that when facilitators put a grade on a learner's experience, they need to make sure they're really good at being facilitators. Because we can't risk failing a learner when it's really a failure due to poor facilitation methods. 
then we also need to ensure inter-rated reliability of the faculty that are using evaluation tools um, that are associated with a grade of some type, particularly with observation rubrics. So we know it's, it's well documented, and our students tell us all the time that the faculty evaluate them differently. Like every clinical instructor does not grade or evaluate the same way. Every skills lab teacher doesn't evaluate the same way. So observation rubrics, it's critical that we get inter-rated reliability, particularly in um, summative evaluation situations. Then when we look at high stakes testing, these, these are environments that result in potentially life-altering outcomes. Now, when you, you think about summative, you know, that can result in a course failure, and, and that certainly um, does alter one's life. Um, we have to make sure that when we use simulation for summative and we attach a grade and, there's, and, and it's a failing grade, we need to make sure that's not just happening in isolation. So we need to look at other considerations too, like their test grades and their clinical evaluations. Um, failing them on just simulation um, should give faculty a pause to um, think about that in, in greater context. Now, high stakes testing has much more risk than just failing a course. And there's some medical specialties that have been using simulation during credentialing for quite a long time. Now, nursing has been thinking about it for a long time. We've been considering it for years, um, and, and particularly with the National League for Nursing. And that's, you know, looking at simulation as part of our NCLEX exam. So it takes it from that recall and, and knowledge and, and application-based exam that we use now, and it, it shows us can the learner actually function. And then in that kind of situation, if the learner fails, they don't get their nursing license. That's high stakes. That's a life-altering consequence that can have far-reaching effects. So the take-home point here is that your faculty needs to be talking about this. It's often, well, it's almost always a, a philosophical decision. So your, your faculty, when they talk about this, they need to decide you know, are you going to use simulation only for formative evaluation, um, summative evaluation, or both? Um, only you and your faculty will know the right answer to that. But whatever you decide, the learner has to know prior to arriving to the experience what's going to happen once they get there. What are the results? So I'm going to turn this back over to Barb now, and she's going to talk to you about professional integrity standard. Thank you, Dr. Layton. So this is another standard that has been altered a little bit because in the past it said um, integrity of participants. And so with this standard, you'll find that professional integrity is professional integrity that is demonstrated and upheld by all individuals in simulation-based experiences. So with that, the criteria that we have is that Everyone is responsible to be respectful and engaged in simulation experiences. And it's very important to, to maintain confidentiality and have a supportive, respectful environment. And if we do come across, and I hope we never do, unprofessional behavior, then to recognize it and, and address it. Important for us to follow standards of practice, and with the revision of the INAXL standards of best practice, the team really worked hard to make sure that these are global, so all disciplines can use the INAXL standards of best practice, and that they can use them in education, research, and practice. So people need to follow our, the standards that we're presenting today, and also their professional code of ethics and embed those into the scenarios. And create a, and maintain a safe learning environment that's not intimidating. You know, Dr. Layton just talked about some of the situations that you can have with formative, summative, and high stakes. We need to also remember that, you know, this is a learning, a teaching strategy for our participants. And then have policies and procedures to maintain confidentiality. 
Where I work, we have a confidentiality document that students in the undergraduate program sign at their first experience in the simulation center. And it states that everyone is expected to keep all events, procedures, all information confidential to maintain the integrity of educational experiences. And in that confidentiality form, that no sharing of information is to occur outside the simulation experience. Otherwise, that would violate our code of ethics. And we also have a statement on there related to audiovisuals that really at our institution, they can only be used during that debriefing with that one specific scenario, with that one specific group of participants and facilitators. And it, they are only for educational purposes only to see you know, what went on during the scenario, what areas went well, what areas need to be improved on, what do we need to reinforce content on. So anything beyond that, there has got to be an additional consent signed. The last standard that we have here is Simulation Enhanced Interprofessional Education, also known as SIM-IPE. So Simulation Enhanced Interprofessional Education enables participants from different professions to engage in a simulated based experience to achieve shared or linked objectives and outcomes. This was one of the standards that was published in 2015 along with the design standard. So not a lot of editing needed to go into the revision of this standard, but as more and more um, simulation scenarios evolve, we're seeing that there is a need for interprofessional collaboration and working together with SIM. And I think that is very, very exciting because as we all know, we don't work in silos. So there needs to be a theoretical framework to structure the SIM IPE. It's a collaborative venture among disciplines. And we need to recognize that the goals of the simulation scenario need to encompass the knowledge, skills, and attitudes of each discipline that they bring to it and to identify what the objectives and the outcomes need to be. And um, we also need to understand that there's barriers to SIM IPE. It's, it's very challenging to get all these different disciplines together to work together when you have a focus. So scheduling, just like anything else, is hard to pull together. And we need to make sure that we evaluate, just like Dr. Layton had discussed, on reliable and valid, um, excuse me, reliable and valid evaluation tools that are used with the SIM IPE. I see this growing in our institution right now beyond academia that we're networking with the hospital and um, OB is my forte so Kim and I work well together on different things and so just to give you an example how that's been incorporated, there were some issues that had gone on with a need for continuing education for the labor and delivery staff. And so through simulation, they were able to practice some of their skills and, um, and revise you know, what they were doing at the hospital with their policies and procedures. Well, the physicians came on board. They were interested and they had a champion of quality in their department. And so there was a a questioning about what simulation is and what can it do for the, the patients that we serve. So the nursing um, educators and the physicians got together and so they planned an, a simulation in a professional experience with the labor and delivery nurses and with the obstetricians. And so there were several sequences of those in several days that everyone got to participate in that. Using the evidence-based practice, having pre-briefing and debriefing and evaluation tools, all a part of that that they collectively work together on. Well, now it has expanded. Now anesthesia says, hey, what are you guys doing over there in OB land? So now they want to jump on board and they did a malignant hyperthermia scenario with the labor and delivery nurses and the physicians. And just recently, um, they decided to do an obstetrical code. So, we don't work in silos, we work together, and the outcome of this is what is best for our patients. We need to always think about quality and safety. 
And then the last that we're going to discuss is the simulation glossary. And as mentioned before, we no longer have a standard on terminology. So the information that we have related to terms are the terms that are, we are using in our standards. And as it states here, consistent terminology provides guidance and clear communication and reflects shared values in simulation experiences, research, and publications. We need to be talking the same talk. A good example I always refer to is fidelity. In research, fidelity is something different than in simulation. In simulation, we talk about the realism. So we need to communicate you know, those terms on a simulationist-based um, terminology, glossary, so everybody knows that we're talking the same, speaking the same language. And I will turn this back over to Dr. Layton. Okay, thanks, Barb. Um, it, it, the discussion about terminology is actually a really interesting one because, you know, when you, you look at the glossary that includes words from our standards and then you look at the SSH dictionary, you know, there's a lot of overlap because, quite honestly, people struggle to decide what is the, the best definition of some of these terms. And starting to see a few more concept analysis being published in the literature, um, which I think is, is a really good start to helping us figure this out. And, you know, it becomes important because when we're doing research or we're doing a lit review, and it, it's really possible and in some cases likely that we're going to miss some literature because we haven't picked the right word. And so um, it's challenging when you see research being published and um, people have created new words for their concepts and like, oh no, another word to describe um, standardized patient or another word to describe confederate and now I'm going to miss that. So. Um, the, the terminology and, and glossary discussion is really important. So also of important is simulation operations. So this standard is brand new and it's not quite yet hot off the presses. So it should be, um, you know, God willing and the creek don't rise, it will be in the December issue of clinical simulation and nursing. So um, keep your eyes open for that. Um, the criterion and the required elements for this standard, create a plan and an organizational guide for your program. And that's going to help give stakeholders confidence in your work and um, in your leadership, including you know, justification to advocate for the resources, um, both financial and human resources, that are necessary for compliance with the, the needs of simulation-based experiences and education. So, um, I really like this standard a lot. I think it almost provides a checklist for your simulation lab or your simulation center or your simulation room that um, helps you, especially in your discussions with senior leadership, to show them what it is that you need in order to be successful and to meet the expected standards of best practice. So that will be coming soon. Okay, um, so today we've outlined the standards of best practice for you as we believe they're vitally important to your success. You know, whether you're just starting out with simulation or whether you're trying to increase the use of simulation in your program. Uh, you know, we've learned a lot using simulation that can and should now be taken back to the traditional clinical environment and um, the other ways that we teach. You know, when, when I think back on how I used to do my post-conferences, um, I, I just shake my head. I mean, it was really bad. Um, my group ended on Friday afternoon, and the last thing any of us wanted to do was sit in a room and, and rehash the day. And so I was pretty good at finding just, you know, like one more thing on the unit to do um, so that we could just skip post-conference and, and end the day on the floor. But now, based on my experience with simulation, I would do my post-conference totally different. I know I would use a debriefing model so I could better help my students to reflect on what they learned that day. And then not only that, you know, how are they going to apply it to their future practice as well? Then when we think about professional integrity, 
you know, how do we display that across all of our learning activities? That's not just a, a simulation thing. You know, are we good role models all the time? You know, do we model, um, I think we try to, to make sure that happens in clinical, but how, do, how well do we do that in our classrooms? And how do we manage confidentiality? You know, it's one thing to talk about FERPA and, and FERPA laws. It's another to, to implement them and, and do it correctly and appropriately. Um, you know, we also, I just realized, I don't know if you have FERPA in Canada, if that's an American thing or not. If it is, um, it's just the, the legalities that we have that prevent us from talking to people about our students. Sometimes that includes people in, in our same program. It's a need-to-know basis. It's kind of like HIPAA for students. Um, and HIPAA just protects our patient confidentiality. Um, then when we look at pre-briefing, we know, based on the literature, that um, pre-briefing helps our learners to be better prepared and that they're more focused when they're caring for the simulated patient. And it, and it also reduces their anxiety. So can we place that same kind of focus on preparation uh, and pre-briefing into their traditional clinical, into their skills lab, into their classroom learning? You know, just taking those few minutes at the beginning of class to, to pre-brief, just like we do in simulation. Um, I think there was a question, it just, I, I'm just going to look here quick. Uh, oh, an example as to how to use this in post-conference. Was that debriefing? I'm assuming that's debriefing in post-conference. So um, I would use the same basic methodology of, you know, reactions. You know, how, how did this go today? You know, what, what happened that you thought went really well? What, what things went really well? What didn't go so well? What challenged you? And then, um, you know, it's a little difficult to go over every patient because it depends on your clinical group size. You could have six different patients to talk about or you could have a dozen different patients to talk about. So, you know, based on, on what you know of how the day went and your observations and what students are telling you, you know, you can, can guide them through some of the challenges that they had. So if somebody had a patient that deteriorated during the day, you could use that as the, the model to talk about. Or if you had, you know, three of, of nine patients all had a, a respiratory illness that they were hospitalized, you could focus in on, on those patients as a group. And then, you know, just making sure that what you did that day um, that you can align it with the, the objectives of the course that you're doing clinical for. So, you know, if the objective was to, I'm sorry, this is very basic, but if the objective was to um, learn how to better manage um, simulated or um, better manage respiratory problems, then you can focus that back in on the uh, the competencies that are needed in order to meet the objectives for that lab. So um, hopefully that gives you an example, but I would just use that same basic model. Um, and then use the advocacy inquiry approach, the DML approach for how to ask the questions. Um, I always just say I'm just going to why them to death, you know, Socratic questioning. Well, why did that happen? Why do you think they responded that way? Why do you think the nurse reacted that way? Why do you think the doctor um, responded that way, and um, just build those same types of things into my clinical post-conference. So hopefully that answered your question on that. Um, mm -hmm. So in summary, sorry, my I don't know if it's happening for all of you, but my screen is like moving together, and um, it's a little distracting. So um, in summary, I just want um, to give you some suggestions to consider as you move forward um, integrating simulation into your program or when you're increasing its use. So, you know, obviously we believe that um, making sure that the standards of best practice are used to inform your decisions is really important. So, 
not only in the STEM lab, but you know, looking at when and how stimulation is used in your program. So including it in your um, interprofessional education, if you do that, or in your institute experiences, if you do that, because not everything has to happen in a lab. I know there's places where um, I have seen them do simulation in a stairwell, and I've seen them do simulation in the cafeteria and outside, and um, those are really fun to do, by the way, when you can take it outside of your lab. Um, making sure that your simulationists are qualified for their position and that faculty development related to the standards is available to them. Then um, ensuring that all aspects of simulation development from objectives through evaluation is aligned with the criteria of the standards. Um, focus in on the quality of your simulations by inviting peer review and ensuring that your evaluation methods are appropriate and, and definitely predetermined. And not forgetting that integrated reliability is vital, um, especially when you're doing summative and high stakes evaluation. So these are just some of the ways that you can use the standards to better inform your practice and to gain support from leadership, you know, especially when you're seeking additional resources and um, you know, faculty or you're, you're seeking staff development um, efforts. So when you're able to put those requests up against standards of best practice, it makes it a little bit easier to make progress on those requests. So um, we thank you for the opportunity to share the standards with you today. And we'll open this session up for any questions or comments that you might have. And this is Barbara. I'm going to add one last plug for our standards. In each one of the standards, we have a section or a couple lines that says, as the science of simulation continues to evolve, so does the need for additions and revisions to the INAXL standards of best practice simulation. Therefore, the INAXL standards of best practice simulation are living documents. So as we continue to gain more knowledge and more research studies are done and more evidence comes through, we will see these change once again. And we're so thankful that we have these as foundational that you know, were first published in 2011 to help guide our practices. Hey, Barb, I see a question about what program slash training would you recommend for somebody to be a qualified simulationist? Do you want to take that one? There are several out there I know in the United States that have simulation programs. Um, I did not divulge too much, but a disclosure I had on the second or third slide was that I, we have a simulation certificate program here at the college I teach at, and it's for graduate credit, and it's, it's totally online. It's important that people that are looking for simulation certificate programs really look and see, you know, if, if the programs fit them. You know, ours might not fit some individuals because they might not want it totally online. There are other programs in the United States that in Idaho and where they have it, you know, I, I don't have that off the top of my head, but I think it's more interactive and more, you know, face-to-face -face programs. There's also a program that is in San Francisco. There is another program that is at Drexel. And Kim, please um, add to this. Um, there's another program that is oh, Robert Morris that's in Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. And what is the other one? There's another one down at the University of Southern Florida or Central Florida? Um, I'm not sure. There's, there's another brand new one out, and I can't remember it either. But those so the, are the ones the that have been, a, they've been around for a while. Like ours has been around since 2010. And so, you know, it's a pretty well-oiled machine, as are the other ones, too. They've been around for a long time. So you have those people that are the simulation experts that facilitate it. But it's really important that you find a program that works for you. Something, you know, within your time frame, can you, you know, do, you know, bits and pieces at a time? Or is it something that you need to com complete all at once? So I would suggest that you Google it. 
<laughs> and find what works for you and then talk to those individuals. You know, as an educator or a clinician, you know, these uh, continuing education takes a lot of time, but then again, you want the credibility that you have the knowledge to do your role. And then another option um, outside of academics is when, um, like the Simulation Innovation Resource Center was put yeah. together by the National League for Nursing, and it has modules um, that you complete related to different pieces of simulation. Um, Washington State University has uh, videos available in module format that they created with grant funding. So those are free of charge because they were for grants. Um, there's immersive programs where you can go places for a week. Um, Robert Morris, I think, has one of those. And um, Excellent. the Center for Medical Simulation, CMS, out in Boston. And so, you know, and then you've got the, um, the webinar resources of INAXL and also the Society for Simulation in Healthcare. Um, EMS is a, a vendor that do, they do fantastic webinars. Um, they do at least one a month, and I probably tune in to nine to ten of them a year because they're they're really interesting and it's things that are um, often new and different as well. So I think if you you know, take a, a holistic approach. You know, read your journals, um, watch your webinars, think about um, academic education with credits attached, see if you can go to an immersive session, look locally, because when Barb rattled all those off, what I kept thinking was, you know, okay, we've got stuff in, in Idaho, Nebraska, Pennsylvania, um, for, you know, they're, they're all over the country, so they're not, um, you know, back when there were just two of them, you were kind of stuck. But now there's there's many more options. And we're also seeing them emerge in Canada as well. We do have a several that are really um, leading edge uh, with with stimulation education for for faculty and uh, staff educators. So we have uh, Sim Money who offers some workshops, uh, weekend type workshops. We have the Ontario Simulation Alliance that offers some um, educational sessions and, and workshops as well. So we are, we're seeing that emerge in Canada as well, so we're really delighted. There was one question that came through uh, around interprofessional simulation, and I was just wondering if I might get Dr. Page to answer this question. So w when you're facilitating interprofessional simulation, who does the debriefing? There's two different schools of thought. One is that you can just have anybody come and debrief that was participating in the simulation, or should you have discipline-specific debriefers? Can you comment um, on that, Dr. Page? Yes. I, uh, so in Milwaukee, we do some interprofessional training with the medical college, so medical students, and with the Ph School of Pharmacy. And I worked with the medical faculty on developing this, and we did talk about the debriefing um, together in the planning phase. So I think that's real important that you figure that out in the design process, how you're going to do the debrief. Because, you know, as two different disciplines, we had different ways we did this. Medical students um, did a lot of standardized patients, where the standardized patients are the ones who kind of led the debrief. And so we had to kind of plan it out together. Um, and we initially started with one nursing faculty and one medical faculty debriefing together, but we kind of had it planned out ahead of time how we were going to facilitate that. Um, the focus of our debrief kind of led around SBAR because nursing students just learned it and medical students were just hearing about it. So we kind of tag team with each other on that a little bit, and then as we got more proficient on it, we then broke down in our smaller groups where we had, um, you know, one faculty debriefing both the medical students and, and the nursing students, and they could be either the uh, nursing faculty or the medical faculty. So I think it's really, really important in the planning phase that you talk about that ahead of time. And uh, we had a little script that we wrote out. We had a certain debriefing method where we dealt with the emotions, and then we broke down the content, and then we did summary takeaway points. So um, I guess that's my, my experience with it on what I found was real helpful. And we learned a lot from each other, too, about um, 
you know, the disciplines, the professions, and, and how we give feedback. That's great. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Layton, this comment is for you, and I just, in your role as the current chair, I, I believe that they've developed another adjunct to the standards, the, the posters. Can you comment on that, please? I would love to comment on the posters because I think they're fabulous. Um, if you go to the INAXL website, so it's um, www.inacsl.org, and you maneuver yourself to the store, um, we have a set of infographs that have been created by uh, Colette Foisy Dahl, who many of you probably know. She works out of uh, McEwen University in Edmonton, Alberta. And um, Jan Barber, who's at Robert Morris University. And what they did, I didn't even know what infographs were when I was asked to spearhead this, so I had to look it up. So for those of you who are like me, um, infographs are just a visual way of showing the meaning of something. So what they did was took each of the standards and created a visual for it. And we've set it up now so that you can print off posters of varying sizes um, to use in your simulation space to help um, feature the standards, to remind facilitators of the standards, to let the students know what's important, um, to let your stakeholders see that when they come in. Um, but, you know, of course, it's, it's a great visual reminder of, of how to follow the standards of best practice. And then what we're working on now, so the operations one is done, and that will not be put on the website until the standard is published. So I would expect to see that um, very early in 2018. And then I have the team working on a general one that encompasses something for all of the standards, because I think we need a calendar. That's my <laughs> goal right now, is I, I want a calendar. I don't have a sim lab that I work in, but I have a spot reserved for the, the infographs calendar on my desk. So that's, that's kind of where we're headed now. But um, just as a funny, we, we did go down the path of thinking, well, we could create shower curtains and we can create bed spreads and um, you know, all just different um, fun things with these. But for now, um, they are posters and they're available online. So thanks for asking about those. Great, they're thank you. They're beautiful and they're informative. Yeah, yes, I, I certainly have uh, ordered my fair share and they are very informative. And I see that our uh, time is drawing to an end and we've had such a great uh, discussion here and lots of interesting uh, points put forward, lots of food for thought. And so I would like to thank each of our panelists for generously sharing their time and expertise with the Canadian audience. You have really emphasized those important components for creating high quality simulation experiences. I would also like to take this time to thank Dr. Baker and the CASN uh, for supporting the Simulation Interest Group and the webinar series. And James, our sincere thanks for the technical support. And to all of you, we appreciate your time with us this afternoon and we hope that we're leaving you with some tools that you can take to your Sim Lab tomorrow. Uh, we'd also like you to keep an eye out for emails that um, I guess on Monday they'll send out a link for an evaluation of today's session. So to all of you, thank you very much. <laughs>